On June 14, 1497, the eve of Cesare and Giovanni Borgia's departure for Naples, their mother Vanozza gave them a farewell supper in her beautiful vineyard in Trastevere. In addition to the two guests of honor, several other kinsmen and friends were present, among whom were the Cardinal of Monreale and young Giuffredo Borgia. They remained at supper until an advanced hour of the night when Cesare and Giovanni took their departure, attended only by a few servants and a mysterious man in a mask who had come to Giovanni whilst he was at table and who almost every day for about a month had been in the habit of visiting him at the Vatican. Then the brothers and these attendants rode together into Rome and as far as the Ponte Quarter. Here Giovanni drew up and informed Cesare that he would not be returning to the Vatican just yet as he was first going elsewhere to amuse himself. With that he took his leave of Cesare and with one single exception in addition to the man in the mask dismissed his servants. In the morning it was found that Giovanni had not yet returned and his uneasy servants informed the Pope of his absence and of the circumstances of it. The Pope, however, was not at all alarmed. Explaining his son's absence in the manner so obviously suggested by Giovanni's parting words to Cesare on the previous night, he assumed that the young Duke was on a visit to some complacent lady and that presently he would return. Later in the day, however, news was brought that his horse had been found loose in the streets in the neighborhood of the Cardinal of Palmer's palace with only one stirrup leather, the other having clearly been cut from the saddle, and at the same time, it was related that the servant who had accompanied him after he had separated from the rest had been found at dawn in the Piazza della Giudeca, mortally wounded and beyond speech, expiring soon after his removal to a neighboring house. Alarm spread through the Vatican, and the anxious Pope ordered inquiries to be made in every quarter, where it was possible that anything might be learned. It was in answer to these inquiries that a boatman of the Schiavoni came forward with the story of what he had seen on the night of Wednesday. He had passed the night on board his boat on guard over the timber with which she was laden. He related that at about the fifth hour of the night, he had seen two men emerge from the narrow street alongside the hospital of San Girolamo and stand on the river's brink at the spot where it was usual for the scavengers to discharge their refuse carts into the water. These men had looked carefully about, as if to make sure that they were not being observed. Seeing no one astir, they made a sign, whereupon a man well mounted on a handsome white horse, his heels armed with golden spurs, rode out of that same narrow street. Behind him, on the crupper of his horse, the boatman, one Giorgio, beheld the body of a man, the head hanging in one direction and the legs in the other. This body was supported there by two other men on foot who walked on either side of the horseman. Arrived at the water's edge, they turned the horse's hind quarters to the river. Then taking the body between them, two of them swung it well out into the stream. Such is the boatman's story, as related by Birchard. When the Pope had heard it, he asked the fellow why he had not immediately gone to give notice of what he had witnessed, to which this Giorgio replied that, in his time, he had seen over a hundred bodies thrown into the Tiber without ever anybody troubling to know anything about them. This story and Gandia's continued absence threw the Pope into a frenzy of apprehension. He ordered the bed of the river to be searched foot by foot. Some hundreds of boatmen and fishermen got to work, and on that same afternoon, the body of the ill-fated Duke of Gandia was brought up in one of the nets. He was not only completely dressed, but his gloves and his purse containing 30 ducats were still at his belt, as was his dagger, the only weapon he had carried. The jewels upon his person, too, were all intact, which made it abundantly clear that his assassination was not the work of thieves. His hands were still tied, and there were from 10 to 14 wounds on his body, in addition to which his throat had been cut. The corpse was taken in a boat to the castle of Sant'Angelo, where it was stripped, washed, and arrayed in the garments of the Captain General of the Church. That same night, on a bier, the body covered with a mantle of brocade, the face looking more beautiful than in life. He was carried by torchlight from Sant'Angelo to Santa Maria del Popolo for burial, quietly and with little pomp. The Pope's distress was terrible. As the procession was crossing the bridge of Sant'Angelo, those who stood there heard his awful cries of anguish, as is related in the dispatches of an eyewitness quoted by Sanuto. 
Alexander shut himself up in his apartments with his passionate sorrow, refusing to see anybody, and it was only by insistence that the Cardinal of Segovia and some of the Pope's familiars contrived to gain admission to his presence. But even then, not for three days could they induce him to taste food, nor did he sleep. At last he roused himself, partly in response to the instances of the Cardinal of Segovia, partly spurred by the desire to avenge the death of his child, and he ordered Rome to be ransacked for the assassins. But although the search was pursued for two months, it proved utterly fruitless. That is the oft-told story of the death of the Duke of Gandia. Those are all the facts concerning it that are known or that ever will be known. The rest is speculation, and this speculation follows the trend of malice rather than of evidence. Rumor had it that Cardinal Escanio Sforza's was the hand that had done this work, and with this rumor Rome was busy for months. It was known that he had quarreled violently with Gandia, who had been grossly insulted by a chamberlain of Ascanio's, and who had wiped out the insult by having the man seized and hanged. Cardinal Ascanio's numerous enemies took care to keep the accusation alive at the Vatican, and Ascanio, in fear for his life, had left Rome and fled to Grotta Ferrata. When summoned to Rome, he had refused to come save under safe conduct. His fears, however, appear to have been groundless, for the Pope attached no importance to the accusation against him, convinced of his innocence, as he informed him. Not until February of the following year was the name of Cesare ever mentioned in connection with the deed. The first rumor of his guilt, synchronized with that of his approaching renunciation of his ecclesiastical career, and there can be little doubt that the former sprang from the latter. The world conceived that it had discovered on Cesare's part a motive for the murder of his brother, Two motives were urged for the crime. One was Cesare's envy of his brother, whom he desired to supplant as a secular prince, fretting in the cassock imposed upon himself, which restrained his unbounded ambition. The other was Cesare's jealousy, springing from the incestuous love for their sister Lucrezia, which he is alleged to have disputed with his brother. Thus, as has been pointed out, to convict Cesare Borgia of a crime which cannot absolutely be proved against him. All that is necessary is that he should be charged with another crime still more horrible, of which even less proof exists. There is much against Cesare Borgia, but it never has been proved and never will be proved that he was a fratricide. Indeed, the few really known facts of the murder all point to a very different conclusion, more or less obvious, which has been discarded, presumably for no better reason than because it was obvious. Where was all this need to go so far afield in quest of a probable murderer imbued with political motives? Where the need to accuse in turn every enemy that Gandia could possibly possess before finally fastening upon his own brother? Certain evidence is afforded by the known facts of the case, scant as they are. It may not amount to much, but at least it is sufficient to warrant a plausible conclusion and there is no justification for discarding it in favor of something for which not a particle of evidence is forthcoming. There is, first of all, the man in the mask to be accounted for, that he is connected with the crime, is eminently probable, if not absolutely certain. It is to be remembered that for a month he had been in the habit of visiting Gandia almost daily. He comes to Vanozza's villa on the night of the murder. Is it too much to suppose that he brought a message from someone from whom he was in the habit of bringing messages? He was seen last on the crupper of Gandia's horse as the latter rode away towards the Jewish quarter. Gandia himself announced that he was bound on pleasure, even without the knowledge which we possess of his licentious habits. No doubt could arise as to the nature of the amusement upon which he was thus bound at dead of night. And there are the conclusions formed in the morning by his father, when it was found that Gandia had not returned. Is it so very difficult to conceive that Gandia, in the course of the assignation to which he went, should have fallen into the hands of an irate father, husband or brother? Is it not really the obvious inference to draw from the few facts that we possess, that it was the inference drawn by the Pope, while rumors of a different sort were rife, is shown by the perquisite made in the house of Antonio Pico della Mirandola, who had a daughter who might have been the object of the young duke's visit and whose house was near the place where Gandia was flung into the Tiber. Let us consider the significance of Gandia's tied hands and the wounds upon his body, in addition to the mortal gash across his throat. To what does this condition point? Surely not to a murder of expediency, 
so much as to a fierce, lustful butchery of vengeance. Surely it suggests that Gandia may have been tortured before his throat was cut. Why else were his wrists pinioned? Had he been swiftly done to death, there would have been no need for that. Had hired assassins done the work, they would not have stayed to pinion him, nor do we think they would have troubled to fling him into the river. They would have slain and left him where he fell. We cannot explain the tied wrists in any other way. Then the man on the handsome white horse, the man whom the four others addressed as men, addressed their lord. Surely that was the master, the personal enemy himself, and it was not Cesare, for Cesare at the time was at the Vatican. There we must leave the mystery of the murder of the Duke of Gandia, but we leave it convinced that such scant evidence as there is points to an affair of sordid gallantry and no wise implicates his brother Cesare.